Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is John Dale. I'm the director of Movement Engaged at the Center for Social Science Research at George Mason University, and I'll be your host today uh, for our webinar titled Forced Displacement, a Quantitative Modeling Perspective. This webinar will portray the availability, data, and capabilities of quantitative analysis and statistical modeling approaches in providing insights migration researchers and human rights practitioners to gain a clearer understanding of the nature of course displacement. Uh, Co-sponsoring today's webinar is the American Association for the Advancement of Science and their Science and Human Rights Coalition. Uh, we will have Karthik Rumanujam, who's a program manager at Movement Engaged, will be handling our questions and answers, which will follow our uh, distinguished panelists and uh, moderating today's session will be Mindy Reiser. Uh, Mindy holds a PhD in social policy from Brandeis University and has evaluated international development programs of uh, United Nations, USAID, and She's also Vice President of Services USA. Uh, so I will now uh, hand things over to Mindy. Good morning, everyone. It's my true pleasure to introduce our very interesting and distinguished panelists. Let me start with Ali Arab, who is the Director of Graduate Studies and Associate Professor of Statistics in the Department of Mathematics and Statistics of Georgetown University. His methodological research is in spatio-temporal and spatial statistics as well as hierarchical Bayesian modeling. He is interested in applications of statistics in environmental science, epidemiology of infectious diseases, ecology, and human rights problems. His current research is focused on developing methodological tools for studying problems in the intersection of climate change and socio-natural phenomena, in particular, bird phenology and climate change, climate and conflict-driven forced migration, and climate change and vector-borne diseases. Ali serves as one of the American Statistical Associations to the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Our next panelist is Geraldine Henningsen. She is a data scientist at the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, UNHCR, that's the UN Refugee Agency, where she specializes in predictive analyses on forcibly displaced populations. And she does this by using machine learning and econometric statistical approaches to support UNHCR's anticipatory action efforts. Before joining UNHCR, Geraldine worked in academia, conducting quantitative research on climate and energy related topics. And then we then have Nathan Wyckoff, who's a data science fellow at the Massive Data Institute in the McCord School of Public Policy at Georgetown University, studying migration using internet data and machine learning. Earlier, he acquired a PhD in statistics from Virginia Tech with a, with a dissertation on sensitivity analysis for computational intensive modeling. We will hear more about this. So to begin, let me turn to Ali. Thank you so much, uh, Mindy. Uh, for the introduction, and uh, thanks, John, for opening the uh, webinar. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, AAAS Science and Human Rights Coalition and the Center for Social Science Research at George Mason University for uh, co-sponsoring and hosting this event. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and thank you all for being here. Uh, so uh, let me, without further ado, uh, talk about the problem. So forced displacement is a global issue and um, 
as you know, we are witnessing the highest levels of displacement on record uh, over the past uh, several years. Uh, the figure here is from UNHCR's mid-year trends uh, in 2023. Uh, and the numbers are uh, uh, on the rise, uh, as you can see. Um, the, uh, in, by some estimates, one person is forcibly displaced every two seconds, and children are disproportionately affected by forced displacement. And so uh, this is an important problem of our, of our lifetime and increasingly important to to uh, work on it. And so at Georgetown, uh, several years ago, a collaborative project was initiated um, by uh, social science and migration um, uh, experts and computer and data scientists. Um, our project is housed within the uh, Massive Data Institute uh, called Massive Data and Displacement Project. You can learn more about it through the link on the slide. Um, so I will talk a little bit about our approach and also, uh, as you will hear from my colleagues uh, from UNHCR and also uh, the Massive Data and Displacement Group, uh, we do um, uh, talk about some data and modeling uh, uh, sort of uh, options and work that we've been busy uh, with over the past several years. So our broad goal really is to understand when and where uh, the forced displacement occurs and how many people are affected uh, by um, forced displacement. And um, uh, ideally, if we had daily worldwide surveys, then we could have uh, really have a better understanding of forced displacement uh, process. Uh, but unfortunately, as you know, this is not a reality. And so instead we are uh, using uh, traditional sources of data that we, we will talk a little bit more about and blending it with organic data, which are uh, sources of data that are sort of generated within the natural settings um, to, uh, to be able to model and predict forced displacement flows, uh, hopefully in a timely manner. So um, to, to talk about organic data a little bit, let me just uh, mention what, what organic data is in case uh, the audience uh, or some in the audience may not be familiar with it. So this is a term that is uh, that refers to data that is generated in a natural setting. The, these are data that are being generated. It's not design-based, but generated uh, based on the actions of individuals and communities and are useful in understanding uh, public opinion, understanding behaviors of individuals and societies. Uh, they do offer real-time um, data that can be used for analysis. They have the promise of reaching to difficult to access environments. Um, and also generally, not always, but generally they can be cheaper than other forms of data. Examples of these are satellite data, newspaper data, um, or uh, other social uh, uh, media type of data, for example, such as Twitter, X, Google, uh, and Instagram, so on and so forth. And so, uh, of course, these data are not without problems. So uh, there are known issues with these uh, sort of data. In general, they're high dimensional. Uh, so uh, sort of the computational capacity to work with these uh, needs to be, um, you know, uh, at a good level. Uh, they may be noisy. They may be a partial and biased uh, um, and among other issues. And so um, this is not to say that, um, we can ignore these problems. Obviously there needs to be work that can be done uh, and it is ongoing research to deal with some of these aspects, uh, but it can be quite useful when blended uh, with traditional sources of data. So let me talk a little bit about our approach um, at the massive data uh, and uh, displacement uh, with predicting forced displacement uh, flows. So. Um, the first step is to identify uh, relevant factors. I'll talk about what these factors could consist of to identify 
uh, traditional data sources as well as organic data sources that can help with this and um, do exploratory work to identify direct and indirect indicators uh, that can inform force displacement and uh, build models and validate models. So um, you can see that the, the approach and the process is very similar to almost any modeling uh, sort of procedure, except for we have uh, basically these additional steps to identify the sources of data that can help us with the relevant factors. Um, some of the traditional uh, possible factors uh, come from administrative data, uh, design data. Uh, these are a lot of times opportunistic surveys um, in sort of smaller uh, sort of focused areas. Uh, or history of movement data. Uh, with big data sources, uh, essentially the factors that we focused on are perceptions, which is how people uh, think about and feel about uh, force displacement, um, bus uh, variables, which is how people and communities and individuals talk about force displacement and finally events which are what are actual events that are occurring that can be uh, that we can learn from those to model and predict force displacement uh, so um, as far as availability of data uh, UNHCR statistics uh, is is an important source of data and uh, um, statistics on this topic my colleague uh, Geraldine from UNHCR will talk about this shortly. I want to mention also other sources such as census data and data from the International Organization of Migration, um, as well as other sources of data. Um, and uh, the big data sources that typically are used in this context or may be used in this context, um, the, the ones in black are the ones that we use uh, currently uh, Georgetown uh, in our project. These are newspaper repositories, Twitter, now X uh, data, Google Trends, uh, Acklet events data, and GDELP. Um, Nathan Wyckoff at the uh, third part of this uh, webinar is going to talk about some of these. Others have used Facebook advertising and LinkedIn, and you can see the ones in pink are the ones that may also be used in this context. Um, so ultimately, we want to understand emerging crisis with the enhanced goal that we can responsibly use organic data as well as uh, other sources of available data to predict force displacement flows during an emerging crisis. And um, hopefully this all can inform um, public policy con considerations um, early warnings and real-time analysis, uh, forced displacement is on the rise, and so the importance of uh, integration of um, individuals as soon as possible is, uh, is an important public policy uh, consideration, and this kind of approach can help with that. And finally, campaigning against a negative sentiment and misinformation that uh, uh, is typically around these forced displacement uh, phenomena. So that's also another public policy consideration that we would like to address with our work. So um, with this brief introduction, let me hand it off to my colleague, uh, Geraldine, to talk a little bit about UNHCR data and modeling um, to continue the webinar. Geraldine, please. Thanks, Ali. Um, you, next slide, please. <laughs> So I'm going to give a brief introduction to the main data products that UNHCR has um, and which kind of form the core of many of the projects that we work on also together with Georgetown. Um, so this is a brief flow chart of how our data is connected just to give you a rough idea uh, on how we work. Um, so the central and core element is the operational data. Next slide, please. Um, so UNHCR's uh, operational data is mainly consisting of registration data. Um, we have uh, 
um, most of the countries that have or uh, take in refugees and asylum seekers and also other um, groups uh, register themselves uh, when they have the resources. But we have many situations in countries where the country and the government need support. And this is where UNHCR steps in and does the registration for the government. Um, Usually these uh, registrations are individual records of forcibly displaced people um, that are registered with UNHCR. Uh, these interviews that we conduct are very lengthy, so we collect uh, a huge amount of data on each individual, which is of course very sensitive data. Um, among other things, the data informs about the origin of the person, sometimes down to the admin three level, sometimes even further down. Um, and of course, it contains where the person went. So whether the person is in a, residing in a refugee camp or is residing in some urban area in the host country. Um, and then, of course, we have next to basic demographic data, we also have detailed data on family relations and other socio-demographic characteristics. Um, we also have a lot of data on vulnerability. That could be whether people, whether the person herself or some family members has uh, is 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 uh, is handicapped or has a disability? Um, that could be things like whether the head of household is a is a single female, especially when the single female is very young. Uh, and all these things inform us in our programmatic work, um, and of course form, as we can see later on, the basic of um, many of the data products that we produce. As I said before, the data is very sensitive, so obviously it cannot be accessed pu publicly. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we internally in UHCA use it a lot to work with it. Next slide, please. So then we have mainly three data products that we produce on a regular basis. First of all, the population statistics. You probably, some of you know it, it uh, kind of the flagship report of UNHCR is the global trends that comes out every June. Um, we have an excessive amount of survey work that we conduct. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later. And then we have a new product, which uh, we call the now casting. Um, and I'm going to introduce this also later. Um, next slide, please. So the population statistics, as I said before, is, is uh, the main flagship statistics that UNHCR produces. It's a biannual official statistics on forcibly displaced populations. Um, we have two reports. We have the global trends, uh, and then we have the mid-year report that Ali cited earlier. Um, we collect the data at the dyadic level, meaning that we always look at country pairs, where one country is the country of origin and one is the country of asylum. So every number every figure is 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 at that level um we have different categories uh, for forcibly displaced populations the main of course are refugees and asylum seekers um to a limited extent also idps but this is probably more the realm of idmc and iom um we have uh, we determine the data as something that we call stocks, which is basically the total amount of the population that resides in the host country and comes from a specific country of origin. And then we have the flows, which we define as the new arrivals uh, from a country of origin to a host country within a given time frame. So that can be a year or a month or whatever. Um, so these are the two sizes we work with. Uh, and then um, we have a limited amount of demographic data on these populations, um, data, of course, on resettlement cases and returnees, because these become increasingly important uh, statistics. So the data, as I said, is collected biannually, uh, is a huge effort. I mean, many, many colleagues are in, involved in this, um, and uh, a lot of the data is directly from our field operations. So it is operational data, but then of course, we also receive the data from national statistical offices, especially Eurostat and then other humanitarian organizations. So for example, IDP data is often shared between different humanitarian organizations. Um, the data is uh, publicly available uh, your, um, through our main portal, which is the Refugee Data Finder. Um, so most of the data that I discuss here will be can be found there. Next slide, please. Then we have uh, the now casting. Next slide, please. Sorry. <laughs> Um, so this is a brand new statistics that has been first published this October this year. 
Um, but we have been working on this since 2021. So basically, in order to increase the frequency with which we publish uh, statistics on refugee and asylum seeker populations, we started now casting the dyadic figures for the stocks. Um, the data is a mix of operational data, which of course is always available for us because the database gets consistently updated every day, every hour, basically. Um, then we're available from national statistical offices and then uh, we have, a, I'm not sure what share at the moment, I think maybe 40%, but I might say something wrong here, is uh, uh, basically now casted estimates based on historical displacement data that we have. Um, you can find the latest month of the now casting data for the stocks in the refugee data finder. Um, the entire time series is yet not available publicly, um, maybe on request, we have to see. Um, and then since this year, we also have begun to uh, develop um, dyadic monthly flows for refugee and asylum seekers, but this is brand new, uh, has a lot of teething problems, unfortunately, still. And um, I, I, I don't want to make a prediction on when this will go public. It will probably take a while. Next slide, please. And then last but not least, we do a lot of survey work. So country operations and regional bureaus and UNHCR, they consistently and constantly conduct uh, very extensive uh, survey work. Many of these surveys are standardized, which is of course interesting when you work with these kind of issues so that the same survey will be applied in different places, can be different camps, even different countries, and then over time frequently. Um, there's not a big systematic, like, like a big system about this so that we would do it every third month or something like this, but, but they are regularly repeated. Um, they cover things like food security, uh, the feeling of safety of, of displaced populations, um, wash, which is a hygienic uh, situation of the of the people. Um, then we have a return the intention service, unfortunately less frequent than we would like. Um, we have a service on displacement reasons, and then we have our big flagship survey, which is the forced displacement survey, which we are currently piloting in South Sudan and hopefully soon in Pakistan, and um, which is a very extensive household survey, which covers a lot of aspects um, of both refugee households and host country households. So to see also the impact that a refugee community has on the host country. So this will be, uh, this is very exciting work from our side because it will give very new insights that we might not have had before. Um, many of the surveys, I would say even most, uh, are curated by our colleagues and can be found in anonymous form in the Microdata Library, um, which is a website uh, you can go to. The data is free. You only have to register and then make a request uh, basically explaining why you want to work with this kind of data. Next slide, please. So now I will briefly touch on one of our modeling um, work. Uh, so basically, to give a little of background, um, UNHCR's planning cycle is three years. Um, and it starts with the planning figures, which is basically um, an estimate on how we think situations will evolve over an, a three-year horizon. And this is produced every year in the beginning of the year by UNHCR um, by expert discussion panels. Um, so it is very qualitative, but that does not mean it is bad. Actually, they do a, an impressive job in terms of precision. Um, to support this exercise, we developed a tool which we call Simograph, which is a, a simulation tool, a very, very simple simulation tool that is based on a predictive model that allows people to run scenarios at the dyadic level to see how specific scenarios might impact uh, future uh, displacement figures for asylum seekers and refugees. And also refugee-like, I have to mention, which in our case mainly means Venezuelans. Next slide, please. So the model is based on a very simple gravity model. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. It was originally developed by Tinbergen and uh, to, to model international trade. So the idea was that countries which are closer or nearer to each other trade more, have a higher trade flow. So if, obviously we don't look at trade flows between countries, but refugee flows. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it's very simple. In, in its essence. So basically you have um, country specific factors, uh, MI, which are country specific factors of the country of origin. You have 
country specific factors of the host country, MJ, and then you have the distance between these two countries. And the distance can be both physically, of course, because we know from our data that the refugees have a tendency to first move to their neighboring countries and also the majority of the neighboring countries uh, take the biggest share of the refugees if there is a crisis. But then we also have cultural aspects and historical aspects. So that means that if countries speak the same language or they have a common colonial past, for example, or um, I, I don't recall all the details now, but uh, many of these cultural and historical aspects, uh, then, then we say there's a higher likelihood of a refugee to seek to this particular country if the cultural distance is, is very close. Um, we have, as country-specific uh, factors of the country of origin, uh, what we call push factors, so basically factors that would push people out of the country, and these are the usual suspects, so conflict fatalities, political instability, the economic of situation. Um, and then we have uh, what we call pull factors, meaning, main, meaning uh, factors in the host country that make the host country attractive for a potential refugee to seek uh, refuge there. And uh, next to the things that are already discussed, we, of course, also have the economic and political situation. But one very, very important aspect is the asylum policies. Um, we know uh, from our modeling work that if countries offer very generous asylum policies, this immediately increases um, the inflow from, a, from a, a country of origin to the country of asylum that, that offers this type of refugee policy. Um, next slide, please. So modeling this type of uh, displacement is not easy. Um, there are a number of issues, actually a lot of issues. Uh, I want to point out three. Um, that this Ali and Nathan will discuss it more in depth later on. So there are three main problems with the, with the displacement data uh, from a statistical point of view. First of all, um, we model this at the dyadic level and over 80% of the diet, diets do not have any positive value. So there is no flow in either direction between the countries. So, so there's a huge amount of non-events, meaning zeros in the data, which makes it a bit difficult to model. The second one is, is that the data is very right skewed, meaning that the bulk of the observations are in the left side of the distribution. So even if we have a positive flow, it usually is around, I don't know, the hundreds, maybe 200, maybe 50. So there's where the bulk of, of the observations lie. And then we have very, very few uh, extreme values to the, to, the left, to the right. And these are the third issue. Um, they are rare events. So these are the Ukraines, the Syria, the Venezuelas, the, the Rohingya situation issues that, that are events in, on the world. And I mean, one might say, luckily, they are very, very rare. Um, but this, from a statistical point of view, makes it very difficult to model them because we don't have much information. And they kind of stick out both in terms of their magnitude um, and, and in terms of like their frequency. So this makes it really, really difficult. We uh, currently use um, a, a very classic model, a pseudo Poisson model with mixed effects at the country and year uh, level. The model um, does reasonably well, um, but it has some issues with, uh, for example, the zero values and also the larger ones. Um, so we went back to the drawing board and uh, developed a new model or actually a, a whole suite of new models uh, where we um, figure out like one of the best that we found was uh, using um, a gradient boosting uh, machine. and. Um, and uh, with, with something probably not many of you are familiar with, uh, it, it, it's called a Tweedy distribution. And next to its silly name, it actually has a very good, um, um, it is very good in modeling, especially these type of situations that we have. So situations you could think of insurance claims or the, uh, the occurrence of rare diseases uh, where you have a lot of non-events. So most of the people have rarely ever an insurance claim. Then you have like, like a bulk in, in, in the lower range. And then you have some very, very few that stick out where I don't know what that person would do, but anyway, there, there would be lots of insurance claims. It's maybe easier to think of rare diseases that would be the epidemic. So of course they happen very, very rarely. 
um, when we do when we apply this uh, this combination, um, both the GBM that can actually account for the nonlinearity in the data that is which is extensive, and then this treaty distribution, we we get relatively better results. Um, especially at the lower range of the values, but we still struggle with the larger ones. Um, and I will conclude here and give over to Ali to discuss this point further. Um, thanks, Geraldine. So, um, so as, as Geraldine mentioned, um, um, the there is definitely need for advanced models and uh, methodological uh, work that needs to be uh, applied here in this context. Um, and so I'm going to go over a few uh, sort of general uh, sort of ideas and directions of the work that we've been um, doing in, in this area uh, before Nathan uh, will talk about a case study on Ukraine. So uh, the classical models and specifically gravity, gravity models, as uh, Geraldine mentioned, have been used uh, extensively in this context. Uh, they tend to provide reasonable fit to the data, um, but um, they're not necessarily very successful in forecasting displacement flows. Um, and even providing the fit really is limited to when assumptions uh, match uh, sort of the, or the data characteristics sort of match the model assumptions for that matter. Um, uh, most often these models are not equipped uh, with uh, the components to capture temporal trends. Um, if you're interested in learning more about this topic um, and this uh, discussion, uh, for a detailed discussion, I refer you to a paper by Bayer et al. And that was published in 22 in Humanities and Social Sciences Communications. Um, so we need to consider extensions and that's what, what's been happening in uh, the literature uh, and consider advanced models. Um, specifically, we need to uh, come up with models that can consider deviations, anomalous periods, and extreme events, displacement bursts, um, uh, and dealing with these uh, the rareness over space and over time. Um, as um, Geraldine also mentioned. So especially for those of you who work on forecasting, you know that a model to be able to do good forecasting needs to uh, address the complexities of the data. So it's not just about inference, but rather to make sure that you do good forecasting. And so uh, some of these complexities um, are the data distribution, which uh, Geraldine alluded to. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, variability over space and time and complex uh, dynamics over space and time. So um, this is a typical histogram of a typical uh, force displaced data set that you'll see a lot of zeros. And again, these are dyadic, so based on the origin, destination sort of countries um, or locations for that matter. You see a lot of zeros, basically no uh, recorded movement um, with a few extreme cases. And so you're dealing with, from a statistical perspective, you're dealing with a distribution that has excess zeros, but at the same time, it also has heavy tails. And so um, dealing with this requires certain um, sort of uh, solutions uh, normal models don't necessarily always work, although they may provide uh, good approximations in some cases. But specifically, if you're interested in forecasting those tail events, then uh, those approximations may not be the best uh, choices. Um, a possible solution would be considering zero modified models. This is an area that I actively work in. Um, I, have a review paper. It's in a slightly different context, but if you're interested to learn more about this, uh, happy to share a copy of that. Uh, just, just briefly, for example, uh, zero inflated Poisson model or a zero inflated uh, or uh, a hurdle model, whether it's Poisson or other models like negative binomial, would, is essentially a mixture model that can handle the zeros and uh, a mixture of zeros with another distribution. That distribution may produce some zeros in the case of zero inflated models, or it may be just a zero truncated distribution in the case of herder models. And of course, there may be need to 
extend this idea a little bit further to even better capture those tail events. And this is an area that we're actively working on. Happy to talk to you if you have any questions about this offline. Um, another sort of uh, characteristic of this sort of data is uh, spatial variability. There's an example map of um, origin and destination and these are in log uh, 10 base um, numbers. And so you can see the spatial variability, the clustering, the, uh, the, uh, the variability over different parts of the world. And it's constantly changing as new events are occurring, of course. Mm -hmm. And finally, temporal variability, that is something that is very important, which is, um, this process is non-stationary, uh, it's a non-stationary time series, it always trends. For example, the past several years, we've seen increasing trends, but also there's those bursts of displacement, those events that occur, the, you know, the Ukraine, the Rohingya, those type of events that occur. And so your model needs to be able to uh, find ways to capture this if you want to come up with a good way of forecasting these methods. And um, multi-scale nature of data. Now, one of the important factors of bringing in organic data is that it can help with um, building forecasting methods that work on a t in a timely manner. Um, traditional data tends to be uh, on sort of larger time scales. Um, takes time to collect the data, to process the data, to report the data products. Um, with organic data, you have the advantage of getting data that you can use for real-time analysis, of course, with the caveats that come with that kind of data, um, but then mixing these sort of data that are on different scales in space and time is, from a statistical modeling perspective, is also another challenge. So now put together all of these challenges, the variability over time, variability over space, uh, multi-scale nature of data, as well as the complex data distribution. And if you want to combine all these together, then you need a flexible framework. The framework that, um, is, uh, w that we're using uh, in our research um, and something that I uh, um, work on uh, in my own research as well in other areas of hierarchical Bayesian. Uh, and for those of you who may not be familiar with this, I re um, this is what I recommend, uh, the paper by Mark Berliner uh, in 1996, which does a nice job of breaking down how uh, dealing with a complex problem can be breaking it down into these parts. Um, that you have data models, uh, process models, and parameter models. Um, and you don't have to be a Bayesian, you know, adopt a Bayesian inference, uh, but models tend to get too complex. And so Bayesian estimation tends to be uh, a better sort of uh, alternative uh, in these kind of scenarios. Uh, so hopefully this gives some idea of the type of statistical challenges that, uh, that we are working on and others in this area are working on. So um, let's now uh, hand it off to uh, Nathan Wyckoff, who's going to talk about a case study of Ukraine. Um, Nathan? Uh, thanks very much, Ali. So Ali just went over kind of a high-level framework that we can think of applying to a variety of different situations. And obviously, we're going to need to uh, tailor this framework and maybe make some adjustments to it as we look at any individual situation. And uh, starting on the next slide, I'd like to talk about, um, in particular, the uh, 2022 uh, refugee crisis in Ukraine that resulted, uh, you know, that occurred as a result of the uh, February 24 uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. So this uh, has set off essentially the largest uh, refugee crisis that we've seen in Europe since the Second World War. Uh, unprecedented in a scale in this particular region and a point in time. And it's a very much an international phenomenon. Ukrainians have been moving uh, just about to every country you can think of, uh, especially a lot of migration from Ukrainians to Europe, which is what we're going to be studying today. But I'd just like to mention that it's kind of a global event and there are even uh, Ukrainians coming uh, to the United States. Next slide, please. Uh, so despite the uh, international nature of this event, we're going to be focusing in on uh, just a few of Ukraine's neighbors. Uh, so in particular, 
uh, if you focus your attention, so the blue arrows here represent uh, movement from Ukraine. So we have a map here, just in case you're not familiar with the geography, uh, represent uh, movement from Ukraine to its four uh, European Union uh, neighbors. Uh, the orange line represents flow to Moldova. And then we also have uh, individuals moving to Belarus uh, and Russia. And uh, one thing that you're going to hear people talk a lot about in the context of migration research is the fact that data, reliable data, are really difficult to uh, come by. We've talked about that a little bit today. And this uh, varies country to country. Uh, so uh, we kind of have better access to data for individuals moving into European Union countries than we do uh, individuals moving into Russia or Belarus. Uh, next slide, please. So we're going to be focusing on, in particular, uh, border crossings into uh, three European Union nations that uh, just kind of happen to have um, good uh, border crossing data in the sense, good in the sense that they collected it very frequently and were willing uh, to share it with us, namely Hungary, Poland, and uh, Slovakia. And so those uh, time series for the first six months post the invasion are shown on screen right now. And qualitatively speaking, you'll notice that there's kind of a surge migration at the very beginning of the crisis, maybe for the first month and a half or so, followed by uh, kind of a shift to a more stationary and lower level of flow. And in the bottom half of the slide, I'm showing you uh, the model we're using uh, to uh, model these data. So Ali mentioned that uh, forced migration data, oftentimes you have these difficult to deal with um, uh, characteristics of the data, such as zero inflation and uh, extreme upper tail values. In this particular crisis, because we're studying migration, which is such a large migration event, and at the country level, we don't have to worry so much zero, about zero inflation for this particular model. And additionally, given the large number of people leaving, Gaussian approximations actually happen to work uh, fairly well. So we're using, in this particular instance, a Gaussian model. And in particular, we're modeling the uh, logarithm of the uh, total outflow to these three countries uh, on a given day. And so um, the logarithm right is just telling you basically the order of magnitude of the flow. And if you look at the stationary period, uh, so kind of beginning in May and thereon in each of these series, you'll notice kind of a sawtooth pattern that oscillates up and down. And that's the day of week effect, which we wanted to take into account uh, in the model using uh, dummy variables and which is shown in red in our formula here. And in addition, we're using organic data, which I'm going to uh, talk to you all uh, about in just a moment here, um, uh, in order to kind of make a prediction just beyond the day a week, uh, because there's clearly more going on at the beginning of the time series. Next slide, please. In particular, so we we um, have a number of different data sources that we use and compare to see which one would be uh, most efficient. Uh, but on this particular study, the one that we found worked best was Google Trends data. And the way that works is that when you put some uh, so so uh, so we as researchers go to the Google Trends web website and we pick a search term such as plane tickets uh, and Google will give us what they call the intensity, which is not precisely defined, of that search term over a, the requested period of time and over the requested region. And that comes back as a number between 0 and 100. Next slide, please. Um, and we... Uh, basically thought up a number of different search terms that could be relevant to various aspects of this uh, crisis. For instance, the plane tickets search term that I just referenced, we think of that as kind of a direct indicator of intentions to move or to leave the country, which we call the flee or the travel indicator. But we also have various uh, contextual and insecurity indicators that will try to understand what factors might influence one's decision to flee rather than just kind of measuring has someone decided to leave as the flee or travel indicator does. Next slide, please. Uh, so this plot is showing us in blue the sum of the migration to the three um, neighbor countries of Ukraine during the first six months of the crisis. And in the orange, we're seeing the results of a model fit directly on the Google Trends data. Uh, and in particular, the travel or kind of the direct indicator. And what I would like you to notice is that the model has a much sharper jump at the beginning of the period than the actual uh, flow does. And essentially, uh, our explanation for this is that at the very outset of the invasion, many people essentially decided in that moment to leave, but it took them various amounts of time based on their geographical distribution, as well as their means and various other factors to actually make the journey from their home to the border and be counted in our border crossing data. And in order to account for that, uh, we're going to be uh, aggregating and lagging the data. And I'll talk to you about that on the next slide, please. 
Uh, so what we mean by lagging the data is shifting the time series of Google Trends data forwards or backwards. And that's what we're seeing in the left figure. We're seeing, I believe it's about a nine day uh, lag. So a Google search being associated with a border crossing about a week later. Um, but even if you kind of adjust the time at which a Google search occurs, we still have a much sharper rise and fall in the Google trend data than in the migration data. So what we're seeing in the right figure is an aggregation where on a given day, instead of simply reporting that day's Google uh, search intensity, we're averaging over some number of days prior to and uh, subsequent to the day in question, which is essentially uh, thickening or blurring the uh, Google Trends uh, data. And that's what we're seeing in the right figure. So we're seeing the lagging and the aggregation done uh, one at a time. Uh, and so what we're going to see on the next slide, please, is uh, a com combination of lagging and aggregation, which yields uh, a much better fit uh, to the observed uh, flow data. Um, uh, basically taking into account the time it takes to get to the border and the variability in the time it takes individuals located throughout Ukraine as a big country uh, to get to the border and with varying access to means of transportation. Next slide, please. This slide is basically answering the question, uh, can we use these models in order to do predictions at the outset of a crisis? And uh, on the left slide, we're seeing, I'm sorry, on the left part of the slide, what we're seeing is four points in time one of which is during the early acute phase of the refugee crisis, which is shown with the black dotted line. And then we have three red dotted lines, which are in the stationary phase of the crisis. And what we did is we fit our predictive models during each of these four time points. And then we evaluated how well they did at predicting migration for the uh, subsequent three weeks. And for the uh, three red lines, because these are all attempting to model how well we do at predicting in the stationary stage, we averaged the performance of the predictors. And what we're looking at in the center, so that was the left panel, what we're looking at in the center panel, uh, titled three-week prediction error, is the performance of models based on various indicators, uh, which are in the colored uh, dots. Uh, and so the early on the left corresponds to the black vertical line and the late on the right corresponds to the average of the three red vertical line test periods. Uh, together with the black dots and dotted line, which is not to use a model at all, but the strategy of simply propagating forward the previous week's migration as our estimate for the following three weeks migration. And what we notice is that early during the uh, kind of dynamic phase of the crisis, we see that there are a variety of models, uh, you know, a variety of uh, social media indicators or Google Trends indicators, uh, which when you base a model on them can do better than simply propagating forward the previous week's mean, but that as the crisis moves into its stationary stage, it becomes difficult to uh, model uh, as evidenced by the fact that none of the models do better in terms of prediction than simply propagating for the previous week's mean. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, thanks so much for your attention. Uh, we couldn't have done this. So the three people here couldn't have done this without uh, a very big uh, team of collaborators. Uh, both. Uh, so we'd like to especially uh, shout out our two other uh, principal investigators here at Georgetown, Lisa Singh and Catherine Donato. Um, and of course, we couldn't do this without uh, many other collaborators at UNHCR as well. Um, I'm going to be serving as kind of the corresponding presenter today. So if you have a question that you're not able to get in during the QA or a comment, I'd love to hear from you. And I can refer you to uh, Ali or Geraldine uh, if uh, required. And that was my email address, just nathan.wykoff at georgetown.com. Or sorry, at edu. Uh, next slide, yeah. And here, and so uh, um, beyond just the principal investigators, there are many other uh, faculty and students and uh, technical staff that uh, we owe great uh, debt of gratitude to and without which this work uh, couldn't be possible. Uh, so now I'd like to uh, pass it off uh, to Mindy. Oh, and, and please see these uh, references if you'd like to learn more. And now I'd actually like to pass it off to Mindy. Okay, there is so much to think about and consider and we want to hear your reflections. So John Dale will now take up uh, the questions and uh, share with you uh, what is emerging from your thoughts. John? Thank you, Mindy. Thank you, Ali and Geraldine and Nathan. This is, this is a fantastic presentation. Uh, I think your, your data sets are amazing. For one, I, I was wondering, do you think you could, uh, or that we could use the same approaches that you've used for understanding forced displacement in Ukraine to understand the forced displacement we're now seeing in Gaza. What challenges, uh, if any, do you think uh, we might have in terms of collecting dyadic 
data in Gaza. Uh, that is the, the data you describe is based on the observed numbers of individuals moving from a particular location to another. Thanks for the question, John. So let me ask Geraldine to mention the data in that particular context, uh, um, you know, the movement data, and then I can I can talk about uh, other sources of data. Nathan and I can refer to that. Yeah, thanks. Gaza is a bit of a special case um, for us, uh, contrary to Ukraine, um, where the situation is quite straightforward people moving from one country to another. In Gaza, we have mainly internal movement at the moment, um, which is not captured by UNHCR's statistics. So we would capture movement from outside of the Palestinian autonomous regions um, to other countries, mainly there could be someone moving to Algeria or Morocco or Belgium. So then this would enter. But as most people in Gaza are not allowed to leave at the current stage. Um, we have very little movement that we can register as UNHCR. Back to you, Ali. Yes, and, and in terms of organic data, um, there, there are possibilities, but there are also challenges. The possibilities are uh, collecting data, for example, Google Trends type of data, you can imagine we, we, can, we can definitely collect data like that. But then um, the data that, you know, one of the important aspects of organic data that it's uh, generated within its natural setting and that natural setting, of course, uh, whether it's inside that particular area, in this case, Gaza, or broader sort of area, uh, you may have specific challenges such as access to internet, uh, or social media, for example. Um, there are nuances on uh, certain areas of the world, certain communities may be using specific social media more than others. Um, and uh, so depending on availability of uh, social media, um, newspaper data, things like that, there are some possibilities. Uh, generally, the challenge in these kind of contexts would be that then you have to also deal with the language of um, not not just English, right? The language uh, that is native to areas. Now, in this particular case with Arabic, we do actually have resources. We have worked on Iraq, for example. So we have the in-house uh, sort of expertise to, to deal with that. Um, uh, but uh, those are all different type of challenges for any new environment that you want to work in, basically, including Ghana. Uh, I mean, communication shutdowns, I guess, uh, they affect the use of social media. I'm wondering if if uh, rising forms of disinformation or misinformation or even malinformation uh, also, you know, that pervade social media uh, and thus, you know, that would ensure the quality of your organic, uh, the organic data that you're trying to blend in order to forecast forced displacement in crisis situations is something that that you have to struggle with. You'd mentioned, you know, some of the, the messiness of, of the organic data, but it seems to me misinformation and disinformation is, or even malinformation where the framings that are a part of social media uh, would, would be difficult to, to deal with when you're using it for forecasting. Yes, absolutely. And so um, we, we have, uh, some ongoing projects in that area. We have published on misinformation on uh, COVID-19, um, especially in context of Venezuela uh, migration. Um, we have um, uh, some work in that area. Our um, computer scientists colleagues are working on that from computer science perspective. Uh, as a statistician, I think to me, uh, misinformation falls under the broad category of potential biases in these sort of data, um, you know, organic data. And if, if you have the auxiliary type of information to basically model bias, then that may be the solution. Uh, it is not, uh, I don't have a sort of panacea uh, statement to say this is how you deal with it because I think misinformation, disinformation within different contexts may also be need to be addressed differently. 
uh, but um, there are ways uh, to, if there are information and data available to, to essentially model the bias. And if it's systematic specifically, then it is possible to address that. Um, but it is a major challenge for sure. Okay. Right. We have a number of questions from our audience. Uh, so I'd like to, to turn to some of those. The first was, uh, how did you integrate the Google trends in your machine learning techniques? Uh, I can take that. So um, uh, ultimately those go in as just additional predictor variables or X variables, people often like to call them or features or something like that. Um, and in particular, we uh, found that it was useful to process them just a little bit first. So in the example I gave, we did uh, basically a filter, if you want to think of it that way, which kind of uh, aggregated the data over time and shifted it uh, with respect to time. So they come in as features. Okay. All right, great. And for natural setting data, what software would be working best, such as Instagram data? I'm not 100% sure what's meant by natural setting. Um, if you were looking at Instagram data, uh, you know, we've been doing working with mostly text data. If you wanted to actually look at the images, I think that would be a little bit more sophisticated, uh, but you could certainly look at tags and other uh, text uh, metadata associated with the image in a manner very similar to how we've been uh, treating our data uh, today. Thank you. Yeah, and just to mention that um, I think, you know, because I mentioned organic data is generated within this natural settings, I think that refers oh. to uh, statement refers to that. Okay. Um, but, um, you know, just just to um, add to what Nathan said, uh, again, it depends on the access and also popularity of those tools in certain communities. Um, and there's also keep in mind with social media, it becomes very complicated because you may actually have the communities. None of these community users are representatives of the population, but only representatives of segments of the population because there's the age group effect. There is, you know, uh, access issues. And there are also maybe more nuances, maybe cultural nuances that in certain communities, for example, a tool like Instagram may be really um, popular and it may not be as popular or it may not be, you may um, not have access to it within certain communities. So uh, these are all the questions that need to be considered within any new context. Okay. We have a question for Geraldine. Uh, could you please provide insights on the denominator of the gravity model? In physics, the model often utilizes the square of distance in the denominator. Can we expect to observe a similar strong effect of distance in this context? Okay. <laughs> I'm not a physicist, I have to say, <laughs> just as a disclaimer. Um, so distance in measured as physical distance has an impact. Uh, I have to admit, I don't know the size of the effect uh, out of the top of my head, but um, we know that, I mean, we, we can both observe this and we can also quantify it that people who flee will primarily flee to neighboring countries. It's it's the cheapest solution for them. It's the most logistically practical one. And so that means that the closer you are to a country that actually experiences a crisis, the more likely you get refugees. I mean, as we could see in Nathan's example of, of Ukraine, we could see, especially in the first month of the crisis, most people would go to the neighboring countries, meaning Moldova, Romania, Slovakia, Hungary, Poland. And then as the crisis progresses, uh, then it depends, it depends on what kind of uh, policies are in place, whether people actually have the means to move on, which is very situational. I mean, some people really flee with not much more than the clothes on, on their back. So of course they don't have the means to kind of board the next plane and go somewhere. Um, so it's very situational, but we, we know that there is a strong component in, in the distance parameter, definitely. Uh, whether it's squared or not, I cannot answer, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's also a fairly technical question for, for Ali. Uh, is the map of space variation an output from ArcGIS? Uh, do you think it's good or possible to add Bay, uh, Bayesian, Bayesian framework to ArcGIS Pro? <laughs> um, I'm not, you know, very familiar with ArcGIS. I don't use ArcGIS, and all of our work is in R or Python, depending on 
if I do it, it's definitely going to be in R, but uh, <laughs> most of the work uh, that in our group we do is in Python. Um, so um, I don't know if it is possible uh, to have a sort of open source uh, type of code added to ArcGIS. If it is, then maybe it is possible. Uh, but my understanding is that it's quite limited. Uh, so um, most of the advanced modeling is happening uh, in platforms like R or Python or other sort of scripting languages. Okay. Yeah. In particular, it was GeoPandas, the Python module that created those maps. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're we're just about out of time here. Um, I know Karthik is going to be putting uh, uh, a link in the Q and A, I guess, uh, for uh, access to this webinar, which has been recorded. Uh, it will be on the AAAS uh, YouTube channel at their Science for uh, Science and Human Rights um, Coalition's YouTube channel. Uh, and we also would like to uh, have you all fill out a survey. You'll, every attendee will be receiving uh, a link later and that will uh, help us uh, with future webinars as well. Um, I'd like to thank our panelists today for joining us and, and Ali, uh, Geraldine, Nathan, uh, you're doing fabulous work and uh, we really appreciate you uh, informing us about, about it. And Mindy, I'd like to thank you for moderating today. Uh, we will be sending out uh, more news about our upcoming webinars shortly and hope that you all will be able to, to join us then. Thank you. Thank you so much. Goodbye, and, all. Uh, <laughs> yes, I, I, Thank so you. I, I, I put my email address and hopefully pe people got a chance to pick up uh, Nathan's. Uh, so if there are further questions, uh, feel free to email us directly. Thank you. Thanks.